All right, so this is kind of like a beginner intermediate session um, where we often look at technology and we teach like this technology right here or that technology there. And you all, you've all been in training classes where you learn one thing. But what about integrating that? What about integrating that thing, right? Because the world is integrated. We don't just work with a single technology. Um, and so this uh, session was to show you kind of the, the intro of how we would start to build uh, an end-to-end -end pipeline. And we based it on a course that we have released um, at training.chef.io. And so we took a two-day course, and then we boiled it down to like 35 minutes. So if you go to training, we go to pump. There's instructor-led training. And there's the DevOps pipeline class. So this thing right here is what we're doing in 35 minutes. So that's a couple days. So if you're interested in like learning how to do it, then come talk to me afterwards. <laughs> okay. Um, and stop me if you have questions, right? We've all been through these conference or presentations where something loses you and you're kind of lost the rest of the way. There's probably nothing I can't explain in like 20 or 30 seconds. So raise your hand, ask a question. If I think I don't have time for it, I'll let you know and then we can deal with it at the end. Okay, so um, let's go back to our slides. I have lots and lots and lots of slides, like four. So what are we going to do? We're going to use um, some source control management, in this case, GitHub. Right? Git is separate from GitHub, but GitHub is our provider we're going to use. We're going to show you a cookbook so we can figure some infrastructure with Chef. Um, we're going to use Jenkins then to automate testing, because what we want is that Jenkins will launch, um, in our case, Docker, and it's going to test your cookbook. So once you push your cookbook to GitHub, then Jenkins will take that cookbook and test it. If it passes, then number four, Jenkins is going to automate the deployment, put it up in Chef server, and let the nodes know they need to converge. So the end is that we'll have a chef, GitHub Chef Jenkins Docker continuous automated pipeline. Here's kind of our, our flow, right? So you got a workstation, um, you got your cookbook, you push your cookbook up to GitHub. Uh, GitHub is going to trigger Jenkins automatically, and Jenkins is going to spin up a Docker container and test all the tests that we're going to write. Um, then Jenkins is going to push the cookbook up to Chef server. And finally, Jenkins will log into those Chef managed nodes and it'll say, hey, you guys need to converge. Chef server's got something for you. They've obviously been pre bootstrapped, so those nodes already know how to talk to Chef server. A larger architecture that you might work with is the same kind of thing, except once you push your, your cookbooks, you might also have some Java code, right? Or uh, might have some Docker, um, a Docker file. Because what you could do is Jenkins could spin up a test kitchen and test your cookbook. It could spin up Maven and download, compile, test, and package your Java application. And when that's done, it could push it up into like JFrog Artifactory or S3 or anywhere you wanted. And then it could download from GitHub um, your Docker file and create a Docker image and push that up to Artifactory S3. Here's Amazon's Elastic Container Registry. Right? And then at the end, Jenkins could then push that cookbook to Chef Server. And what are your nodes going to do? Your nodes could download the cookbook that tells them to go to ECR and download the Docker container. That, and also, it could download, uh, Chef could download the um, Java jar file from Artifactory and deploy the entire thing. And all of this is um, repeatable. And um, Jenkins just automates the whole thing. That's the end of the slides. OK, so what do I have? Um, here's uh, what I'm running so far, right? Up here, architecture, I've got a Jenkins master. Uh, I've got an agent. So Jenkins has a master agent paradigm where the master kind of controls it, but the work of doing all the builds happens out on the agents. You don't have to do it that way, but it's the right way. Doing builds on the master is dangerous. Um, many reasons. So uh, you have these external machines, and Jenkins Master can then send the build to an external machine to base on criteria. You can have Linux machines and Windows machines, and it can you divvy them out um, based on what's specified in the build. And I've got two nodes out there that we're going to converge. And you can see I've already started with the nodes, already converged them. They say this is Web 1, hello world, really interesting. And this is Web 2, hello world. So those are the nodes that are sitting out there. Um, we did use a role, so there is a role that I'm going to reference. Um, you can see it right here. It just says run list recipe Apache. So 
I need that later because Jenkins needs to do a search on Chef Server and say, hey, Chef Server, what are all, where's all your web servers? I need to make them converge. And that, uh, by, by having this role, um, we can then figure out all the servers. Now, the right way to do it is policy files, but I don't have time in this presentation to really deal with policy files. They're a little more complex. So I wouldn't use roles in production. I'd use policy files, but there you go. We have a role for what we're using. Okay, so I've got my window. So the top window is my local laptop here, and the bottom window is um, back end to Jenkins. This is Jenkins master that I just SSH'd into. You can see, like, I ran it recently, like five minutes before this session, so I'd make sure it worked. And you can see that my pipeline ran, completed success. So, spoiler alert, we already know it works. All right, so let's talk about um, our pipeline. So this is my Git repo. And this repo contains a cookbook, right? There's recipes, test files, kitchen YAML, and there's my Jenkins file. So let's look at these. So we have a recipe, and we have our basic default recipe, and it's not too complex, right? We have an Ubuntu system, we're simply, whoa, we're simply installing, <laughs> Okay, so we're simply, there we are. We're installing Apache on the local machine. We're writing a file into var www.html index.html, which is simply where Apache looks for its index.html file. You can see the content's gonna say this is, and it's gonna just pick the node name out. I assigned each one web one and web two. So it'll say this is web one, hello world, or this is web two, hello world. Pretty simple, and then it enables it, so if you reboot this machine, um, Apache will start again, and it'll start Apache now. Are we good with that? Okay, cool. So the next thing we look at is our test file. So in test integration default, this is our inspect file. We're gonna test some things. We need to set this up because remember, we want to run, we wanna run test kitchen. So we need to write tests so we can test our cookbook. Uh, and here you can see we're gonna test first, is Apache actually installed? Be a good thing to know. Um, that file that we wanted to write, uh, var www.html index.html, that it should be there on the file system, and that its content should match hello world. Now, because we have these two forward slashes around hello world, it doesn't have to be the whole file, but somewhere in there, it needs to find this, the string hello world. Then we're going to make sure that Apache is actually running, and you'll notice it's upstart service. So when you're, it's interesting um, with Ubuntu. If you're running it on, on an instance, you would use service like we did in the recipe. But when you're testing it in Test Kitchen, you have to use upstart service, just nature of Apache of uh, Ubuntu. And we're testing that Apache 2 is enabled and running because a recipe said enable it and run it. So we're just testing that. And this last test, it's kind of like a green light, red light. All those other tests test specific things. But what if I missed something, right? What if I didn't, for example, I'm not testing port number. I'm assuming it's port 80. Well, that could be a mistake. What if it launched on port 81? And so this last one says describe command curl localhost. So it's going to make a web request of itself. And it's standard out, meaning the message, the thing we come back should have the, word hello, the words hello world in there. And so this last one is nice because it tests everything. Like if, if this fails, then you got a problem, even if you missed it in one of your previous tests. So just keep that in mind when you're writing tests. It's good to have like a sanity check like this. That yes, all your tests pass, but does it work? Okay, any questions about our tests in InSpec? Okay. All right, a few more files to look at. We have our kitchen YAML file because we are going to launch Test Kitchen, so we need a kitchen YAML. And we're setting it up to run in Docker, right? We could do Vagrant, we could do another EC2 instance, but we're using Docker. And for any of you who haven't run Test Kitchen lately, this is important. Um, uh, with Chef's new licensing scheme, Test Kitchen will stop and say, so licensing, what do you got? Do you got licensing? Where is it? Show me, you know, and that'll stop your automation when it asks you a question. So if you were to put product name chef and product underscore version 14, it'll set your version to 14, which doesn't require licensing. So that's just a little workaround to make, to let Test Kitchen still automate its process without having to deal with any licensing. And you can also see in this Test Kitchen file, I mean, not know what a Test Kitchen file is, Kitchen YAML. 
we didn't go with that. So here we're going to test it. So my machines that I'm running, those four machines, are all Ubuntu 18.04. So the container I launch should be Ubuntu 18.04, right? Test it in the environment that you want to run it on. So we're, gonna, we're only testing on Ubuntu 18.04. And then the last two bits of info, we're saying use the Apache default recipe that I showed you and use the test file that I showed you to run the tests. So any questions about how we're launching um, Test Kitchen? That's the easy stuff. Actually, it's all easy, but that's the stuff you all know already. OK, so the last file we have to talk about is Jenkins' file. This is the core of, right? Jenkins is the core. I had a dream that um, I've, I've told some of you a story, I'm sure, that I, I dreamt that I was telling somebody you could go to the moon using Jenkins, because Jenkins will define every step along the way. Every, everything that's required to get a person to the moon, you can define in Jenkins. It was a weird dream, but it's kind of true, right? Anything you can do, Jenkins can do, just does for you, right? Kosuki, um, he, he was like Adam, right? Adam wrote Chef because he didn't like another product that he was using, and he just said, screw it, I'm going to write my own. Kosuki did the same thing. He was working for Sun, didn't like the manual process. Boom, he built Hudson, which then became Jenkins. Um, where was I going with that? Um, so I have no idea. I just babble on. Oh, right, so Jenkins file. This, so um, you can do Jenkins with a GUI, but code is always better. So this is our pipeline script, declarative script. And I'm going to walk through it. OK, so we start with pipeline, saying that this is a pipeline that we're doing. And then agent label agent farm. So as I mentioned, you could run um, Jenkins. You could have a bunch of Linux machines over there, a bunch of Windows machines over there. And let's say if you're 15 Windows machines, Five of them are mapping, like they're, they have really high CPU and memory for like mapping applications. And so you could do agent label Linux, and it'll run those on the Linux machines. Agent label Windows, it'll pick one of the 15, and, and Jenkins Master will manage which of those 15 it launches on and does the load balancing in there. Or you could do label mapping, and it'll just pick those five Windows machines that are specific to, you know, that can handle a mapping application. So when you write your script, you can choose what machine it runs on. Or you can do agent any, and um, Jenkins will just figure it out. So that works too. In Jenkins, you have these things called stages. And so we are going to list everything as these stages. So as each stage is one thing you want to do, one step to get to the moon. And our first stage is update Ubuntu. So Jenkins is only doing what you can do anyways at the command line. And so Jenkins has to have the thing you want to do. So if you want, to, if you want Jenkins to work with Docker, Docker has to be on that machine. Now, the right way to do this is in a Docker container. I don't have a whiteboard. It'd be great. Um, and it, so imagine that you've got a machine, and anytime you want to do something, you spin up a Docker container, and you do all your testing in the Docker container. So when you blow it up, you only damage the container and nothing outside of it, because you will, blow, you will fry stuff. Absolutely. Using, Jenkins is powerful. I, the other day, just to play with it, I'm like, I wonder if I did an rm-rf slash star. And I did that, and it just, it fry, I just smoked it. You know, it, it will do that. If you have permissions, it'll just blow itself away. So uh, um, Docker is the way to do it. But I'm not doing that here. That would just, um, they'd be cheating. They'd be like, you know, I just run the Docker container, and the Prezo would be done in like five minutes. OK, so the first thing is we're running on an Ubuntu, so we do a sudo apt-get update. Just get my Docker agent all updated. Make sure everything's you know, the latest and greatest. Next, we want to install ChefDK. Why do we install ChefDK? Why do we install ChefDK? Someone tell me. Sorry, what? Test Kitchen, that's one. Why else? Uh, yeah, convergence, right? So we want it because there's three things, right? We want to run Test Kitchen. That's part of Chef DK. We want to upload, so we're knife cookbook upload. I know, if, you know we're not using Workshelf. I'll tell you why later. So, uh, so we want to upload to Chef Server. That's the second reason. And we want to converge the nodes. That's the third reason. So we need those tools, so we're going to install Chef DK. And I decided to put some logic around it because you don't want to install Chef DK every single time you run a build. I mean, you could, but it's a big waste of time, right? If it's installed, it's installed. So let's make sure it's installed. And if it is, let's skip that step. So what do I do? I create a variable called Chef DK exists, random variable. And I set it to, um, does file exist? Let me come to this side. There we go. File exists. And I look for user bin Chef client. It's just a file that will exist if you install Chef DK. So if this resolves to true, I'm going to assume ChefDK is already installed and skip it. So 
if chef dk exists, meaning if this is true, that the file exists, just skip chef install and go on to the next. Otherwise, meaning chef dk is not installed, and this is how you use Jenkins. You can use these as this says shell out and run a wget. You all recognize this, right? Get the chef dk 390 for Ubuntu um, download. Ooh, 1604. Ooh, that could cause a problem. We'll test it. So download the file and then install it. sudo dpackage dash i install the thing I just downloaded. So that's going to install chef dk on the agent machine. Any questions? OK. Now, I want my cookbook. The cookbook's the thing I'm dealing with. So let's get the cookbook. And we say, it says here, git, and then there's a credential. So Jenkins is only doing what you can do anyways. So you need to give it permission to do things for you. And if I have my cookbook up in git, because we don't have everything in public repos, right? We usually use private repos, and you have to have SSH keys to get to the private repo. We need to give Jenkins those permissions. So what did I do? Down here in the Jenkins dashboard, credentials. No. Oh, it's a, uh, oh, weird, huh, resolution. Phew, <laughs> where's my credentials? Okay, so I created a couple of creds. I have to give Jenkins permission, so let's do that. The first thing is, let's start, here it is, GitHub creds. So what this does, it says, I'm gonna give, so what did I do with GitHub, right? I have a private key on my local machine. I have the public key up in GitHub. The private key and the public key allow me to talk. Basically, it lets GitHub authenticate that I'm really me. And so it's got my username and my private key. So if we look at my credential here, do uh, an update. Okay, you can see that's the wrong one. GitHub creds, there we go. Update. Okay, there it says Techno Trainer TM1. Well, if you look at my repo, look at my username up there, Techno Trainer TM1. Okay, and there's my key, which you can't see because now they can seal it, but um, that's, I guarantee you, that is the key I created so that I could talk to my GitHub repo. So that cred exists. Okay, let's look at the other creds. Um, this one, uh, uh, this SSH username private key says Ubuntu, right here. Um, Jenkins needs to, so the Jenkins master has to talk to my Jenkins agent, right? And so it needs an SSH key to log in there. The Jenkins master needs to log into those two nodes and tell them to convert. So it needs an SSH key. Because all of you that are using username and password, because that's what you learned when you took the Chef Essentials course, you need to stop doing that. Because you really need to use SSH keys. That's the, that's the way to do it. And so um, this will allow Jenkins to log into those machines. Uh, this top one, this is a really cool one. So when I log in you know, to manage that Chef.io and I create an organization, what's that first thing I download? Chefstarter.zip, right? And in the zip, what's the most important files in that zip file? What do I need in there? Yeah, I need the ebar evan or the username.pem, and I need the, um, the knife.rb file, right? Those two files let me talk to the chef server and let me talk to the nodes. So Jenkins needs those. So Jenkins gives you the ability to upload a zip file, and then it will unzip it, and then it can take stuff out of there. And it's cool, it's smart enough to not write it to disk when it does that, because it's a secret. And so it just puts it in memory, like a, like a virtual file space. So you can't, no one can get on the machine and find it. And then our last credential is gonna let us talk to Slack. Now I didn't have Slack in that diagram, but I decided to throw it in there this morning that it will do a Slack notification as well. Okay, any questions on our four credentials and what they're for? <coughs> All right, so let's go back to our Jenkins file. So this one, Right, download cookbook says, use this cred called GitHub creds and go get the thing from my repo, which is the cookbook that I've just been walking you through, download the cookbook. Now we have the cookbook locally. Then we need to install Docker because Test Kitchen's gonna use Docker. Again, I do a little, if Docker's installed, don't do this again. And, uh, but if it isn't installed, you can see here, Docker has three components you need. First one is called containerd.io, in this order, by the way. The next one is Docker CECLI, 
And the third one then is actual Docker. So those three things, if you install those, will allow Docker to run on this machine. And then once I've downloaded them, I simply do the installs. I install containerd.io, Docker CECLI, and then Docker CE. So I've now done the installs. And then I put my user, this is Ubuntu, this is the user that I'm logged into those machines as. Um, I put them in the root and Docker groups just to deal with permission issues. Now, yes, it's a little cheaty to put them in root because now they can do anything and you don't, I don't get errors. Um, normally, you'd set up a Docker container with all the right permissions contained because right now Ubuntu could do, I could do anything in this with you know, a Jenkins build and destroy whatever I wanted to. So um, probably not the best way for, for real world, but works for us here. Then I, I run some Docker because I want to see does it work, right? Docker run hello world. So Docker has this thing called Docker Hub. It's like Chef Supermarket. It's a big community site where you can download stuff. Um, and so it goes out there and picks up something called hello world and it runs it. Why do you think I did that? What's the point? <laughs> Just to test that it's working. So if something breaks, at least I know Docker's working. If I can look in the console output and I can see hello world, well, I know Docker at least is functioning and my problem is probably elsewhere. Any questions so far? Yes. Why not use Chef? Yeah. You could totally use Chef. There's absolutely no reason why you can't use Chef in this. You could, you could well, you have to install Chef first, right? Because if you don't have Chef on a machine, either it's pre-baked into the image or you have it install it. And then after that, you could use Chef to do all this kind of stuff. Absolutely. A million ways to deal with it all. I just wanted to show the individual steps. Um, okay. Now, we need to install, so when we installed Chef DK, we installed Test Kitchen but that didn't install what, Chef Ki what Test Kitchen runs on, right? Because Test Kitchen can run on Vagrant, it can run on an EC2 instance, we're gonna run in Docker, so we need to specify the connectivity to the thing you wanna run it on, and so to do that, you do a Chef Gem install kitchen Docker. The problem is, Ruby Gems doesn't exist on the machine. So the first thing is I, I do is I do a sudo apt-get install Ruby Gems and Ruby Dev, and so um, I install Ruby, and then I can do a Chef Gem install kitchen Docker, and now, We've got um, the Kitchen Docker gem installed, and now Test Kitchen can run. Yep. When installing Ruby that way, install a really old version of Ruby, though. I can't hear you, what? I was saying, when installing Ruby that way, install a really old version of Ruby, though. Uh-huh. Oh, you, yeah, you can specify versions if you want. So, you know, you can absolutely do that. I mean, really, the way you would do is you you would do every, you know, you'd go through each piece of this, figure out what works, the errors, spend hours on Stack Overflow to figure out you know, what you have to do and why is it have to be 5.3.0 and that's, you know, I, believe me, this is, I didn't write this in 10 minutes, okay? It, it took a while. And so yeah, you figure out what works and then you bake it into a Docker container. Back there? Um, I thought you know, you'd think so um, and it should just work but, um, for whatever reason, I ran into an issue where the Chef DK wasn't, it wasn't installing, it wasn't accessing, maybe it's, just, maybe it's simply a pathing issue that I didn't de deal with. For whatever reason, I couldn't get it past the fact that Ruby, because I thought that too, like, well, it always works for me normally, why is it not working now? You know, it, it just changes things when you're dealing with Jenkins, because you're not the one doing it. You're not, you can't just sit there and modify your path, so you can modify the path for Jenkins, and that might fix the issue. Okay, any questions up to this point? Any other questions? All right, cool. Now, Test Kitchen's installed, so let's run it. We have the cookbook, right? We brought the cookbook down up here, right, with this step. Git means download from GitHub, uh, this cookbook. So we have the cookbook. Let's go ahead and run it. So we run sudo kitchen test, and that's just gonna launch. We have our, it has the cookbook, it has the test file, it's got kitchen.yaml, it's got Docker, it's got everything it needs, and it's going to launch Test Kitchen, and it's gonna run its tests. If those tests fail, it's going to kill the build right there. It's going to stop. If your tests pass, then we'll get to go on to the next step. And that next step is to notify you that we um, have a build, and it's going to wait for your approval at this step. You don't have to do this. You could push straight through to um, uh, the production servers if you wanted to, or you can have it stop, and a human can do a thing. And so. We're connected with Slack, which means I installed a plugin, a Slack plugin, and I had to go to Slack and I had to get a token and bring that token into Jenkins so that Jenkins could talk to, remember I had the Slack credential, right? I had to set up the permissions to talk to Slack. And what does it say? Message is, team DevOps, please approve. 
And it's going to be the job name, which is um, Chef Pipeline V3, the build number, which every time you run it, it increments the build number. And then it's going to give you a link. So you could be sitting at dinner, and your phone pops up on Slack, and it says, please approve the build. You can hit the button, and it'll open up Jenkins interface on your phone, and you could approve it or not if you wanted to. And then it's going to stop and wait right here. Stage, let the human feel important. Message, click proceed to continue the build. So when you go there, it's going to be wait and wait. And if you don't put a timeout, it's going to wait and wait. You can put a timeout. Um, anyways, when you click the link that was given to you in Slack, it's going to bring you up to um, the Jenkins interface, and you'll have this message. It's a little hard to find. You have to hover over it, over a little box, but you'll find it. And then you will click proceed or abort. Those are your choices, and it'll either continue the build or stop the build. That's your choice. Okay, this part is a little complex, and there's a million ways to do this. So somebody can say, well, why didn't you do it this way? Absolutely. There's lots of ways to do this thing. <clears throat> and so what I did was um, I need to talk to Chef Server and those nodes. So you remember I created a credential where I uploaded that chefstarter.zip? Okay, well, here's where we use it. So what we're doing is saying find the credential. Find the credential called Chef Server Creds. It's just one of the four creds that I created. And take that zip file, unzip it, and put that into a temporary variable called Chef Repo. So now, if you go into Chef Repo, it's like a virtual file system. It's just not written to disk, but you can create directories under there and move around in it and execute files from it and all of that. Um, and so I do that. First thing I do is I say, well, let's go into that, that, that zip file, that chefstarter.zip, and let's create a directory structure, dash p, create all the directories, called chef repo cookbooks Apache. Because I can't really do a chef cookbook. I guess I could do a chef cookbook create in there, but it seems weird. So um, like a chef generate cookbook, not going to do it. So I create a directory structure for my cookbook. The reason I'm doing this is so that Knife can come in here and see the cookbook. Because if Knife can see the cookbook, it can upload the cookbook. Now, this step is actually superfluous. I could really just path it, but I wanted to make it really explicit to what we're doing here. Next step, um, I get rid of any Burks file. So if you had been playing around with this and you use Burks shelf and you threw a Burks file dot and, and it used Burks shelf and it created a Burks file dot lock, it'll crash this particular step. And I don't want to do that. So if you happen to have a Burks file because we don't need it, get rid of it. Get rid of the Burks file dot lock, not the actual Burks file, just the lock. Next, when I downloaded the cookbook, up here, right? I downloaded the cookbook. It stuck it in a place called the workspace. Physically written to disk, the workspace is where all your working files are. I'm saying, well, in my workspace are all my Apache files. Let's move those into the Apache cookbook because I want Knife to see it and upload it. Cool. Well, now we get to do some stuff. The whole thing comes to this. Knife, cookbook, upload Apache. I would probably use policy files to do this, but then there's some complexity around the policy file.json.lock file that you have to deal with, so I decided to keep it simple. Um, and so it's going to upload the cookbook. It's going to overwrite the version number so that if I'm fixing typos, I don't have to keep incrementing the version. You could leave the dash dash force out, and then you just need to make sure you upload, you'd update the version number every time. Um, it's going to look in this directory Chef Repo Cookbooks for the Apache Cookbook, which is why this line really isn't necessary because I can get reference it this way, but it's there. Um, yeah, question? Great question. What if you have dependent cookbooks? I'm sorry, what? Well, I would do policy files, right? Policy files, that's why policy files are the way to do it because they, could, yeah, question over here? I don't know. Okay. Not sure. Um, OK. Um, and you don't have to get real complex with this, right? Like, it, you know, people want to think, like, aren't there these amazing creative ways to do it? Yeah, sure. This is going to push it into the chef server. Is there more you need than that? If there is, use the right tool for that. So, OK. And then we're saying, so that's where you find the cookbook. And then we need to give it access to the knife.rb file so that it can. Um, it, it actually can have its configuration so it can talk to chef server. And we only point to knife.rb. It points to the, that username.pem file, 
right? So you point to one, it points to the other, and now this command has everything it needs to upload to the Chef server. The last step is to converge the nodes. Same kind of thing. I created a cred called EC2 creds. That credential is, has the, um, the, U, the SSH key that I use when I launch the, the instances in Amazon so that Jenkins can log into those nodes. We take that key and we place it in a temporary variable called agent SSH key. And here's why. We're gonna run a knife SSH role web server. Remember in the beginning, long, long time ago, I said we're using a role. The reason we're using a role is so that knife SSH can function so that it can just hit the chef server, do a search, figure out all the nodes that are web servers, and cause all of them to converge. Because we want all of our web servers to converge. I don't want to just hit one or two. And so there we've got the dash x Ubuntu. That's the username that, um, I, that you need to log into this particular instance. And you can see the SSH key. I don't know where Jenkins is placing the SSH key. I don't care. Wherever it's placing it when it, you, when it invokes the cred is where it's going to look for it. Good enough for me. Um, I, could, I could expose this, right? That's the beautiful thing, beautiful thing about Jenkins. You could just do something like, you know, um, P, you know, C to agent H, SSH key and then PWD. I mean, you could figure out where it's putting stuff if you wanted to. Anyways, it's going to log in. It's going to run Chef Client so that all the nodes converge. And here again is that configuration because knife needs knife.rb to function. Any questions up here? Steve? Yeah, just a success, right? So Docker, not only does it, you know, when you run Docker, not only does it show you, not, uh, test kitchen, not only does it show you, you know, six successful, zero failures, it gives you an exit code, okay? And in fact, usually zero means it worked and anything else means it failed. And so it's looking for the exit code. Jenkins always looks for the exit code. So no matter what you're doing, if it need, your code or your thing that you're running needs to return that exit code so Jenkins knows if it failed or succeeded. I actually don't know what you would do if you couldn't get an exit code, if you had to like manually look for words. I mean, I guess you could figure that out, but I don't know how to do it. Okay, any question about our Jenkins file? Okay, um, last step. We can see if this actually functions. Last step is, so what have we done? Right, we have our cookbook. We can push it up to GitHub. We know Jenkins is going to start Test Kitchen. It's going to upload to the Chef server, and it's going to converge those nodes. What's the last piece that we're missing? Notification, notification from? Oh, yeah, well, there is a Slack notification as well, but, but from GitHub, right? Because we need to connect GitHub to Jenkins because we don't want to sit there and... We, I mean, we could log into Jenkins and force the build, but that's not automated. So let's automate that. So here I am in my... Git repo, and in the actual repo, I go to settings, webhooks, and here is a webhook, and it says 34.227.78.127, which if we look up in our Jenkins master, is the same IP address. Okay, so this says go to the server, go to port 8080, that's the default um, port for Jenkins, and then, this is real important, you have to go to github webhook slash. If you miss that last trailing slash, it won't work. So that says, if anybody pushes to this repo, send a notification to Jenkins, that particular Jenkins master. But then you got to configure the, the project on the other side to receive it. So here is my project. And let's go to configure. Jenkins, there it is, configure. Okay, and right here under build triggers, GitHub hook trigger for git, git SEM polling. That just simply says, listen for anything from GitHub, and if it's the same repo that I'm dealing with, then that's gonna trigger me. And the rest of the build is super simple. We say pipeline script from, from SEM, git specifically, there's my repo URL, that's the one we've been walking through. There's the credentials I created. Remember I created the credentials so that Jenkins could talk to GitHub for me? It's right there. Um, okay. I'm saying there's the branch, the master branch, because I only have one branch right now. 
And then finally, there's the file. That's the Jenkins file that we walked through, that big, long pipeline script. That's it. So it says, go into that repo, go to that branch, and find that Jenkins file, and then run it. And that's all you need in the Jenkins configuration, because the rest of the configuration is where? In the Jenkins file. Okay. So now, here we are in, okay, let's go back in here. So, let's try it out. So let's make a change. So right now, our servers, right, says hello world. There's our second one. It's web two, says hello world, super interesting. Bet you've never seen that before, okay. So let's uh, make some changes. Let's edit our recipe. And let's say, hello, ChefConf 2019. Okay, so now that's our recipe. So what else do I need to change now? Tests. I have two instances where that shows up, right here in the content of the file. Okay, and down here when I just test the sanity test, does the thing actually work? Okay, did I screw that up? Is it all good? Okay. So, now I do a git add, git commit, so um, change content to ChefConf 2019. I do a git push. I've already set that origin and master go to my repo, so all I have to do is a git push. So it just pushed it to the repo. Okay, you can see down here, this is, this is um, Jenkins. Look, it just did something. Let's go watch it. So here we are. Oh, and you can see it already triggered it. So build 10, so I've done nine builds already, is starting. Let's see if we can, there it is, it's already doing it. So, oh, let's get our pipeline. Um, so this is the build, this is Slack. All right, you can see it checked it out, it updated Ubuntu, it installed ChefDK, it downloaded the cookbook, it installed Docker, it installed Ruby in the test kitchen. It's running test kitchen right now. See, so run test kitchen. That takes a little while because um, it's actually running test kitchen. So, and, I, and, and when I do a kitchen test, it did everything. It destroyed the container if it existed. It, it created a new container. It converged Chef on there. Um, it moved the cookbook over and installed everything. And then it, and it verified the tests. And if everything passed, or regardless if it passed, then it destroys it again. So it takes a little while. It's done. Oh, and here it is. See, Team DevOps, please approve ChefConf Pipeline V3, build 10. Oh, OK. So I better, you know. Sorry, excuse me, everybody. I have a thing I have to do. So I click on Open. And there it is, and it's waiting for me. So when I hover over, it says, click proceed to continue the build. Okay, yeah, let's do it. Proceed. The last step, it's uploading the cookbook. It's converging nodes. Does, it, does Jenkins bump the metadata in the cookbook? Only if you tell it to. Oh, and it's done, and it's successful. Now, if we go up to our our little uh, nodes, and I refresh them, there's the content. <laughs> and that's the end-to-end -end pipeline. And like I said in this, in this uh, diagram, thank you for that, by the way, um, you can incorporate all the tools. You have. Jenkins has like 2,200 plugins. I counted them recently. <laughs> Of course, I wrote a script that did it. But anyways, I counted all 2,200 plugins available. And um, so, yeah, Jenkins has, you know, uh, uh, Java and Docker is two of the things you can do. You can just, do, you can, there's anything you can do with it. Do you tend to set up a different pipeline for each environment? Are you going through integration and QA? Ah, uh, yeah, you know what's cool about that? So the question is, can you, do you set up a different environment for each, um, uh, like, in, do you set up a different pipeline for each environment? So Jenkins can actually be the gatekeeper, and it should be the gatekeeper to your repo. 
So let's say you've got your um, master branch, uh, and you've got um, a, a staging branch, and you've got um, a testing branch, and you've got you know, um, Steve's feature branch right, that he, Steve's playing around in. You can use Jenkins to then move the code through. So Steve tests his own code. It works. He promotes that um, using Jenkins to testing. Maybe another team comes in and tests that. And another team comes in and says, well, it passed um, the testing, so let's move it to staging. And then, and then the approvals go up the line as well. And so you can use Jenkins to move things through the branches. And so what you might want to do is set up different branches for each of those, not different pipelines, but different branches. And you know, as code moves up the, each branch by different people approving it, then by the time it gets to master, that's typically your production release. Good question. Yep. When thinking about using GitLab and GitLab Runner, do you have any preference or opinion? GitLab is cool. It's an end-to-end -end process. You know, they've kind of what I've shown you here. They've kind of built into their products as like an end-to-end. -end. But I don't actually have experience with GitLab. Maybe other people do here, but um, I don't. Could you show your Jenkins pipeline one more time? Sure. Oh, uh, I mean the the graphic. Oh. Does that show the stages? Okay, so see the let the human feel important? Yeah. So let's say this row that I'm in is the developers. So we made the changes to the cookbook, we pushed it. Mm -hmm. And we get to that let the human feel important. Now I want that row over there to come in to this and answer that input. Is that possible? Mm, so you're talking about having um, a decision tree on which Slack channel it sends it to. Well, I'm, Is that right? I'm saying that just as this group of people mm -hmm. here can see that web page and that group over there can see it, I want to be able to say I can do these actions on the web page and I want them to be able to do these other actions. So I want them to run uh -huh. that stage, let human feel. Well, <clears throat> when we configure Jenkins, and I don't know if this is going to answer your question or not. So we've got to manage Jenkins because I think you can only configure a single, um, a single Slack channel. And I don't know if that's, I was going to do, I was going to use instead of um, my own Slack here, I was going to use the community Slack. And I realized that could be bad because then everything goes to the single channel that I've defined. Because here we are in configure system and you scroll to the bottom here and here's where you set up the global Slack notifier. So, and there's no option for like multiple abilities. So I'm sure that somebody's figured it out. I don't know how to do it. Anybody here know how to do that? Yeah? There's a plugin for that. I love it. Yep, there you go. There's a plugin for that. Good. So, Simon shown that you can run the Jenkins agents on Fargate. On what? On Fargate, containerized. Okay, yeah. My organization's security posture is no more EC2. Is there a way to run my Jenkins master on a containerized solution? Absolutely. That's the way to do it, actually. So, you know, um, you would totally just, you can create a container that has Jenkins inside of it. Jenkins master. This all could run in a containerized environment. You could have the Jenkins master in containers talking to the Jenkins agents in containers and run it anywhere. Okay. Yep. Yeah, it can do anything you can do from the command line, it can do for you, no matter what it is. It's just running commands at the command line. That's all it's doing. I would use Terraform for that. And I would have Jenkins launch the Terraform. That way you can test it. You can test Jenkins. You can test Terraform in Jenkins and then let Jenkins launch Terraform now that it's been tested and, it, and have it spin up your, your bare metal. Okay. Yeah, one more. Uh, it's not. The two ways you could get it are one, come and see me right now and I'll give it to you or take that class and it's all, you, you build it in the class. <laughs> so I think that's it, right, for time? All right, well, thank you, everybody.